This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. Well, first of all, I mean, you've written all these amazing movies and, and worked with amazing people, but I mean, obviously the top of your mountain was writing for the Muppets, obviously. They were my favorite experience. <laughs> They, oh, I did. I just Brian Hinch and I just exchanged uh, notes recently on his birthday. Yeah, um, that was the that was the. I guess that's the cast pajamas or the bee's knees or the, you know the yeah the, like I'm, the nuts, I'm not, nuts. I mean, you're um, working with the Muppets. It was it's totally amazing. unexpected. Um, Brian, Brian and I had met during Hook and uh, uh, and, and another book that we wanted to do. The Paul Gallico was a man of his magic, which is a Gallico novel I'm adapting now. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and they, he, we'd met and liked each other and, and he came to me, Disney was going to pull the plug on Muppet Treasure Island. Mm-hmm. They didn't like where it was going. Um, and they came to me and, and Brian said, well, you read the script. We're about to, we're about to lose this project, you know, and we're having problems. Can you just read it and give me some feedback? And I read it, and there was no human beings in the script. There was no Jim Hawkins. There was no Lon John. So they were all Muppets. But by, by the way, for people who are not catching up, um, you wrote Treasure Island, uh, Muppet Treasure Island. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Yeah. yeah, people might not know. Well, what... I, I mean, I, I came in and put my oar in the water with great people like Jerry Jewell and you sure, know, sure, and, sure, uh, uh, Bill Bottolotta and stuff like that. But um, uh, and I read it and said, "There's no humans. You can't make this movie with no humans. You can't right. have Jim Hawkins be." A puppet and 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 Robert and uh, Long John Silver be a puppet. You can't do it. You know, um, it's like Lucas when he first did Star Wars. They were all robots. You know, and you you got to have the, the human being element. You know, uh, is that true? Wait a minute. Is that true? When Star Wars, when he wrote first wrote it, everybody it was, was CPO. It was CPO and R two D two. They were the heroes. Okay, right. And then Luke yeah. showed up yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Got it. So um, we 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 would shut it up at my house and. Um, uh, up in the Hudson River, which and and actually Brian's brother lived nearby. We snowstorms and piles of snow, so we spent three days working on the script. And and the reason there were no humans in the script is that Frank Oz did not like to work with children. He's got twelve of his own, but he doesn't like. To work. And so I said, well, let me write some scenes and see if we can convince Frank different differently. Um, so um, we wrote some scenes and. Um, they were they loved the scenes because I I brought some some humanity back into the story, especially the relationship between Jim and London Silver was been a seminal relationship in my my upbringing about villains. I mean I have a whole thing on villains, why they're the good guys, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so it was you were able, we were able to do that emotional connection between Jim and Long John. keep all the jokes in, keep all the stuff in, you know. But the funny part was casting the Muppets in their various roles because they are like movie stars. Yeah. I mean, I would suggest I would I would suggest uh, uh, we they were having a hard time casting Kermit. So I would suggest that, and Brian would say, "Nah, Kermit won't play that role. He's not. He won't be good in that kind of part." Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, what do we do with Miss Piggy? You know, um, but you know, she had to have just the right role, or she wouldn't do the film. She wanted to. Pick- <laughs> Want a bigger trailer or something? So <laughs> you begin to understand that this that this this world of Muppets is like an archaeological dig. They have a history the way movie stars have a history. Yeah. Oh, it's absolutely. Incredible. And and the people that created the character are the only ones who could do them. There was a big controversy when Jim died if they were going to continue Kermit. Oh wow. So and that's what's interesting. I mean, when Frank Oz's hand goes up Miss Piggy's skirt, he's Miss Piggy. Nobody else is Miss Piggy but Frank Oz. You know. Um, and, um, so that was interesting to see that, that the, the, the Gonzo and Rizzo, you know, I can't remember the performer's name, but they were created by the puppeteer, by the Muppeteer. Mm-hmm. So as long as they were alive, they did the characters, you know, and then you had other Muppeteers who came in and did ancillary characters, but casting Kermit and casting Miss Piggy was the most difficult part of the, of the show. Wow. You know, uh, and, uh, uh, we missed, we made Miss Piggy Benjamin Gunn who'd been marooned on the island and had a string of pirate lovers, including Long John Silver. Uh, and, and actually, I, it was fun to watch Frank work on set because he, he would stay in character even between takes. Did he? Re- Are you serious? Yeah. 
Oh, I got a better line than that. That's a terrible line. For, for, hey, Brian, let's shoot it again. You know. <laughs> Who wrote this shit? And, and so and Brian and, and Miss Piggy would have a dialogue, you know, between takes uh, uh, with Frank as Miss Piggy. Same thing, same, same thing with Steve. Same thing with Steve Whitmire, who did um, Kermit. They, they would normally stay in character between takes unless they took a break and right. shed the, you know, shed the, uh, shed the. Uh, and then when my kids were with me on the set um, in London, and um, uh, we had, the, and you're, they're alive. I mean, they don't have eyes that don't. Their eyes, eyes don't move. They don't have, you know. They're not marionettes, right? No, you know um, they don't. You know, and we're leaving the set, and we actually the set are saying goodbye to Brian. At the end of the day, and there's a whole trolley full of all the Muppets hanging impaled on their on their spikes. You know, <gasps> oh my god! And Julia, who just directed, who just directed her fourth film, she was I think ten then. When she freaked out, said, "Oh my god, they're dead." You know, I don't want to see this. I mean, their eyes suddenly their eyes. No, of course. Were like, uh, no, of course. Right. So it was, and, and getting to work with Jerry Jewell and the whole Muppet Henson team was extraordinary. Wow. It must've been you so know, much fun working such, with them. Such a culture, such a, such a culture of, um, of, 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 of caring and talk about character, you know, I mean, those characters don't change. They're like movie stars. No, they absolutely. Always play themselves. My, my, my yeah. Kermit, the frog I grew up with, which was Jim and the Kermit, the yeah. frog that lives today uh, the character is the same. His all his principles are the same. Miss Piggies is the same. Gonzo's is the same. Uh, Fozzie's is the same. It's it, they are they're movie stars, but they yeah. it's they're 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 actually uh, it, it's fascinating.